Well, Mark, that kind of falls into the conversation you and I had about TPP and THL, kind of the, those letters that firefighters have heard when we talk about turnout gear, and you talked about it. We, we oversimplify it sometimes when we talk about THL. You want to talk a little bit about that and, and kind of your thoughts on it? Sure. I mean, Denise would be the first person to say that, you know, the effects of heat stress and cardiovascular strain is a pretty complex animal. You know, there's an awful lot of things that go into it. And clearly, the turnout gear is one of those elements. Um, the gear that is protecting you from thermal and flame uh, also keeps your body from cooling itself. So that's certainly one element of the mix. Um, but there are all those other elements. There's the elevated temperature that you're experiencing when you're fighting fires. Uh, there's the metabolic work involved. There's your family medical history. You know, there's whatever medications you're on. So there's lots of other elements that impact how it affects the cardiovascular system. Um, and the key piece of the puzzle is can we make gear that is protective but also allows it to be as light and as breathable as possible. So THL is the number that, you know, is the system that we use to measure that in the standard, but it's only one measurement at one set of environmental conditions that isn't necessarily reflective of the conditions that firefighters are faced with when they're fighting a fire. So uh, we need to do a lot more work in terms of understanding the physiology. Uh, it's one of the things that we've worked very closely on, which is physiological monitoring. So here in a research environment, um, you know, we can rig them up with 12 lead EKGs and core body temperatures and all that stuff that you can't do in the field. But, you know, are there tools that we can use that would be more effective to monitor people in other training situations that could then at some point be deployed in the field to have full-time monitoring of firefighters um, when they're doing operations? So it's a lot of technology out there that isn't necessarily ready for prime time today, uh, but it's an important part of the mix is looking at what can we do that would increase you know, firefighter safety and really start drilling down to the condition of the firefighter inside that protective envelope. So this is kind of a two-part question. Um, Mark kind of touched on the second part already. I'll just ask it to reiterate. So first part of it would be directed towards like Gavin, Denise, or gentleman from NIOSH. Um, since we've been keeping track of line of duty deaths for firefighters uh, that are cardiovascular related, would you say that you're seeing more nowadays since we've been burning this, like what we said, this toxic, toxic soup, this, uh, you know, more petroleum-based products, or would you say you saw more back when we were burning more Class A materials, more natural elements? I, I'm willing to start uh, the conversation on that. I, I think the number of firefighter fatalities has definitely been decreasing. But I, I would be hesitant to, to link it just to what's burning in buildings. The, the environment in which firefighters are operating has changed dramatically, right? From the protection they're wearing, the respiratory protection, the PPE, the codes, even the fire service's commitment to training and education has changed dramatically. So I think the number of fires are down, the number of firefighter fatalities are down. The interplay between the environment in which you're working and fatalities is more complex. And I think where it might be um, seen is in some of these large multiple fatalities, particularly where fire overcomes firefighters uh, who weren't expecting uh, the conditions to change as quickly and dramatically as they did. I think that's the piece that is related to the modern fire environment. I'd invite some others to opine. I guess what I would add to that, and I, I don't know if this necessarily goes towards your question or not, but it's, uh, I mean, we have seen the rate of traumatic firefighter fatalities, whether it's overrun by fire or you fall through the building or the building falls on you, increase per 100,000 fires since over the last 30, 40 years, which is, is a little bit troubling. Uh, 
what I would I would take it a step further, and I, I don't know necessarily that fatalities is a measurement that we need to get too hung up on. It's a lot easier to measure. It's a very definite measurement that we do really well. Uh, but when you start looking at close calls and effectiveness, things that we don't measure very well at all, uh, I would say that if we did measure them good, that we would see a, a rather large uptick in the number of firefighters trying to get out of an environment very quickly or it, to take it towards effectiveness the fire went out and no one got hurt we commonly hear that as a, a success story and the reality is well all fires are eventually going to go out and for the most part people aren't getting hurt does that mean the fire service showed up and did a good job i would argue that that's a extremely poor measurement and we can do a lot better in understanding uh, something as simple as what's the victim exposed to? In, in many cases, it's a total success story that you find them, you drag them out. Uh, what if there, you could have done something slightly different to expose them a little bit less that could potentially greatly increase their recovery time or their survivability? Those, those little things right there, I think, is, is where we're really digging in and saying that, all right, maybe we haven't been doing it 100% great. If we can do it a little bit better, then awesome. We're moving in the right direction. We, if we're not continually improving and we're staying the same, we're not getting any better. I don't think that should make any of us happy at all. Uh, so it might not necessarily be line of duty death count. I mean, we're looking at every single time that you roll out of the firehouse. Uh, if we can make that a little bit better, those million times a year or whatever it is, then we're really having a big impact. I just want to be the one dissenting voice up here a little bit in partiality. Um, the old adage, do we kill them now or do we kill them later, has never been truer than today of what we're exposing our members to. And I don't think we truly know what we have as a line of duty death out there. Pat mentioned putting 308 names on that memorial this, this September. It's a staggering number for me. But that's only the ones that we know of that have been under presumptive laws. How many more firefighters are out there are dying from exposures on this job that we're not even calculating in. And I, so I don't know if we truly know the numbers, but again, to Steve's point, I, I don't want to get so tied into fatalities because injuries are an incredible impact on our, on our service. When we talk 80,000 injuries a year, we're not even encapsulating the exposures in there. So <clears throat> studies like this start to help us paint that picture and start to gain some knowledge so we can build on this and maybe get a truer picture of what how the fire service is being impacted. Let me let me jump in for a second because we know the traumatic line of duty deaths those are the ones that capture everybody's attention their immediate attention and oftentimes lead to very quick action and changes. Backing up a little bit there is one thing that is becoming increasingly clear is we're having more line of duty deaths 24 hours after a fire or post fire. Is, and I'm not asking you to predict the outcome of the research, but Kenny, Denise, uh, Gavin, um, do, you, do you suspect we're going to find anything there that is going to show up, whether it be cardiac strain or chemical exposure, that's going to be related to uh, a line of duty death post fire ground operations? Well, I appreciate the question, Tim, because we do know from prior research that firefighters are more likely, are much more likely to suffer a sudden cardiac event following strenuous firefighting activity. And that's the work of Dr. Kales has shown a firefighter is 10 to 100 times more likely to suffer a sudden cardiac event following firefighting activity than during station work. So it really brings us to the question, what is it about firefighting that's triggering the event? And that's a complex question. First thing we need to know is that firefighting does not trigger a sudden cardiac event in people who are healthy. So it's some complex interaction between underlying disease and the cardiovascular strain of fighting a fire. And that's precisely one of the things we're trying to look at. And briefly on the physiology, briefly, I promise. We're, we're looking at the EKG, the electrical activity of the heart. We're looking at the vessels, the stiffness of the vessels, and the potential for ischemic changes. And we're also looking at the blood and the clotting potential because it is looking at those mechanisms that we think is going to help us understand what's causing the cardiovascular events in the period following firefighting activity, and also looking at that important period 
we know from the general population as well as from firefighting studies that there is an increased risk following strenuous work. So in this particular study, it will be the first that will monitor firefighters for 12 hours after firefighting. And I want to thank the participants again, <laughs> because having firefighters sit around for 12 hours has not been easy, but they've all been willing to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, if I can follow up on that really quick. One of the, um, I would say, key phrases that has come out of this project and something that, that we're, we're, we're talking quite regularly on is, is what does it take to put the firefighter back in service? Uh, it, it's an analogy that we're starting to draw. We know what it takes to put a piece of apparatus back in service, right? You get done with the job, you clean the tools, you put them back away, you sharpen whatever you need, you replace what was broken. You know what it takes to put an apparatus back in service. In fact, probably all of us in probie school or firefighter basic or whatever it was, were trained to put the apparatus back in service. Uh, but we really don't know what it takes to put the firefighter back in service. And, and what can we do in the short term and in the long term, and in some cases in the preparation, in order to help our firefighters to be back in service for that next call, or so that they have recovered uh, more clearly or more, more fully, and could potentially reduce that vulnerable period that we have after the fire service. And again, I also want to repeat what Denise said. You know, we, these firefighters have been here since 7 a.m., Okay, and they're going to be here for another three hours after this, maybe two and a half hours after this. <laughs> three. three. In order to get that timeline, and what they don't know is tomorrow morning when they arrive again at 7 o'clock in the morning, the blood draw and the data that we're going to collect tomorrow morning is going to give us a 24-hour recovery time frame. So there's a lot of great information that we're going to be able to get by these firefighters, the dedication that they've shown to be here early, two days in a row, and stay with us until about 10 p.m., it, it's going to help us really to start to establish that timeline of putting the firefighter back in service. We're a long way from it, but one of the key outcomes of this study, and, and thank you to you for helping us provide this forum, is to get that conversation started. How can we do that, and how can we get that information out? Uh, this study it covered, obviously, a, a broad range of things from firefighter fatigue, exertion, uh, carcinogens, cardiovascular, you know, uh, the victims, you know, what, what the victims are experiencing. Um, so I guess it's kind of a general question to the, sen uh, to the seven of you from my aspect is individually or that, and I, what sort of objectives when you're done evaluating the data and coming up with that are you looking for? And what I mean by that is I was listening to the gentleman from UL speak and uh, as he was talking about exposures. We're taught, we're trained that, you know, not necessarily to, but we stay on our we stay on our bottles until we get down to a certain amount of time or to a certain amount. We don't go in too deep so that we can't get out. So I, when I say objectives, you know, changes within our tactics of perhaps pulling us out earlier with what we're with what we're being exposed to, both them and the victims. I mean, you spoke of perhaps, and we've talked about it too. You know, shelter in place, or you get the water on the you know, the fire to get it out. So I'm just curious as to what objectives, if that's the correct word, the seven of you are, are hoping to get from this eventually. And I know that we're, as you said, a long way from finished. So we're, we're going to look at our component really hard as, as far as how, how the fire environment is impacted as you interact with it. So we're looking at what happens when closed doors become open, whether it's the front door, whether it's bedrooms, uh, what are the victims exposed to, what are the firefighters exposed to from a heat and gas concentration standpoint. And, and the thing that has me so excited is that that's the world I live in. So I am so used to looking at that. Where the value is going to come from is when I start intersecting my data with, with Gavin's data, with Denise's data, with Kenny's data, we might see things that we didn't even anticipate seeing. Uh, so there's a number of things. We kind of go into this with some hypotheses, which is the, the fun part of science and, and how we designed the, the series of experiments the way it is. But there's a, a number of outcomes here that I think that we're all going to be surprised with because I, I don't think we've run a study yet where we haven't been surprised by some of the outcomes. And in this case, I think it's going to be the, the crossing of, of data that's never been crossed before. So I think that that's, that's going to take us uh, to some interesting places that will probably lead to other questions that will lead to more research. Uh, but you've got to start somewhere. 
and uh, this is uh, really going down that down that path. 